Right, good afternoon everyone um, and uh, welcome to this online debate on the greening of the building sector, which is kindly organised by the European Environmental Bureau. Today's discussion is going to focus on the options that are available to reduce carbon emissions from buildings based on a report that is being published today by the EEB and will be shared uh, on this platform in um, a few minutes. And so among those options, um, probably one which hasn't received a lot of attention until now is to apply so-called consumption corridors to buildings. And that essentially means putting a lower and an upper limit on the amount of energy that can be consumed by each uh, individual building or apartment. So to explore this topic today, uh, we're going to hear first a series of presentations from three different experts and academics whom I will introduce in a second. And then we'll hear some reactions by policymakers from the European Parliament and the European Commission before turning to a panel discussion uh, which will be open to the audience and that I will have the pleasure of moderating. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, by the way, um, well, you can use the Q&A function on Zoom and uh, I will try and uh, take as many uh, questions from the audience as possible. Now, we have a packed agenda, so let me um, present straight away our three academics. Uh, first to take the floor will be Pierre Mamut from the University of Münster. Pierre uh, will make a presentation on behalf of Professor Doris Fuchs, who unfortunately was unable to join us today. The second presentation will be given by Anja Beerwith from the Wuppertal Institute in Germany. And finally, we will turn to Yamina Saheb, a climate and energy expert at OpenEXP. This is a global network of independent experts based in Paris. Now on the side of policymakers, we will then uh, hear reactions to the presentations from Tieran Kuff, an Irish MEP from the Greens Party in the European Parliament, and uh, also from Stephen uh, Moser, who is head of unit at the European Commission, where he supervises policies on energy efficiency and buildings. One last point, um, the webinar is being recorded and so it will be put online on the EB's website, so please watch your language. The whole event will be made public very soon. I think I mentioned everything, so let's get started immediately with a presentation by Pia Mamut. Pia, the floor is yours. And I think you have to unmute your mic. There you go. Thank you for the introduction. Well, thanks for inviting us. Um, unfortunately, as uh, you said, Doris Fuchs can't be here today uh, for health reasons. Uh, however, she is very interested in the topic. Um, and I'll be sure to bring the insights from our discussion today back to her. Given that we have the introductory contribution today, we would like to set the scene and paint a very broad picture of the various dimensions of building and buildings from a sustainability perspective. The siting of building may be associated with habitat destruction and almost always involve the sealing of soil. So this is one first point to mention um, that uh, relates to sustainability. Moreover, siting decisions affect mobility patterns and associated with them energy use. Travel to work, to shops, to schools and doctors all are influenced by siting decisions, as is the choice of transport. And this goes both ways, of course. I can choose to, to build residential or office buildings, for instance, close to a train station, or I can plan train services to such residential or office areas. The materials used for building have an ecological footprint, as well as implications for energy use, if not health effects during the use of the buildings. Materials used may also be associated with distinctive aspects of social sustainability, depending on how they are sourced and produced. Next, 
the use of buildings, be it as residences, offices, factories, or what have you, is associated with energy use. Heating and cooling are the major contributors here. Always the appliance use, but also other aspects of technology use, such as elevators, etc., matter. And then there's the post use phase, where the question is what if anything happens to the building and its parts? and issues of habitat restoration, material recovery, but also to a large extent material disposal arise. So importantly, and this is what research has shown again and again here, the sustainability implications along all of these aspects are very much determined by structural, political and economic factors. The individual consumer citizen tends to have very little influence here. And this is true even for the use phase. So what are the, 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 the current trends that we can observe? Politics has fostered a trend towards better insulation for a considerable time now. And as far as we know, there's um, also an interesting development in terms of more sustainable materials and more sustainable designs, uh, such as, for example, the zero energy house. And also, we are all aware that sustainability considerations, both in terms of habitat and mobility patterns, have become an aspect in siting decisions, although not seldom a controversial one. Appliance ownership and use, however, is increasing and even if appliances become more energy efficient, energy saving tend to be eaten up by a turn to larger appliances or other forms of rebound effects. And there's some hope associated with appliances such as smart meters, of course. And now let me turn to one of the most interesting areas where we see currently developments. And that's the question of size of residential homes. On the one side, there's still a trend towards la larger residences, Mac mansions, especially the, uh, as especially the Anglo-American literature calls them. And anybody who has seen the residential developments in the US with huge pseudo foidal houses will understand what is meant. And given that living space is correlated with energy use for heating and cooling, such a trend towards increasingly larger sizes matters a lot. And it's not just these new developments that show this trend. If you go to areas with small residential homes in German cities with the housing market under pressure, you'll find that wealthier families buy up two of the houses and turn them into one. Or you will find real estate investors who use houses as speculative objects, often with the effect that houses stay empty because nobody can afford to live in them. And this again increases the pressure for slightly more affordable building sites in the countryside. It highlights that there's also a social and economic dimension involved in these developments as access to small residences for those who cannot afford large ones declines. And next to this trend towards larger residences, we also see a rising interest in small spaces, however for which the tiny house has become a symbol. However, it's also, it also exists in terms of, a, of small apartment buildings, um, especially in urban centers. And um, while these movements and initiatives present promising transition endeavors, they still stand at a crossroads between providing sound alternatives for strong sustainable consumption or reinforcing a green growth and weak sustainable consumption path. So um, the question that remains is what happens when we look at all of these aspects and trends from a beyond growth perspective? Um, we will recognize the need for, but also the potential for totally different ideas and strategies. We will have to talk about sufficiency understood as of two types of enough, of course. In the realm of housing, this implies a minimum social floor with, uh, which recognizes 
social human needs and a maximum biophysical ceiling. And therefore we will have to talk about such lower and upper limits and we will have to adjust the wheels in the system accordingly from the question of government support for housing to regulations and how we remunerate architects. So let me point out five issues um, as a takeaway that we need to focus on. The first one is limits to size, lower and upper limits to the size of residencies. For instance, or rather focus on a participatory discussion about how many square meters per person are adequate. This issue and its contextual, social, economic and cultural conditions are already explored and discussed both in science and in politics. And participants to the debate, such as Cohen, Rao and Min, Lettenmeyer, um, suggested, for instance, um, about 14 square meters as a minimum and 20 square meters as a maximum for a single household, or 40 to 80 square meters uh, for a four, uh, four person household. However, it is also emphasized that such calculated metrics of housing size cannot simply be imposed, but it requires a, um, a democratic process and agreement upon limits. We also need to talk about limits in the use phase. If we arrive at individual carbon budgets, something also discussed as necessary for sustainability transformation, those would affect how much energy we can actually consume in the use phase. And third, we may also need to talk about limits to ownership and more importantly, the issue of housing space as a speculative object on investment funds. This has an ecological dimension with residencies being sustained, though empty for significant amounts of time. It also has a social dimension as apartments offered to tourists on Airbnb or otherwise are not available um, as residences for the local population anymore. And here also co-living and co-working space networks across the world may, despite their otherwise interesting and promising models, come with negative side effects such as social disruption on, uh, of remote locations and high flight volumes. And finally, we, prob we probably will want to talk about building new or limits to building new and pay more attention to how prolong the use of buildings, even if for other purposes and how to build so that that becomes not only feasible, but easy. And um, the bottom line of all this, and I think my, my, um, the other speakers will also come back to this topic, is that we will need to pay more attention to a sufficiency orientation in the context of building and buildings next to ongoing improvements, of course, in efficiency and consistency. And if you are interested, um, a new uh, consider this new publication focusing on limits, consumption minima and maxima in this short book, um, which is available open access from Routledge. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pierre, for this uh, interesting presentation. Um, and um, I think quite provocative ideas that are contained in there. Um, so let me turn now to our next speaker, and that's Anya Beerwith from the Wibbletal Institute. Yeah, thank you, Frederick, and good afternoon from my side also. Uh, and actually, it the the the, the point uh, where you stopped, Pierre, is pretty much perfect from for my start. Um, because I'm going a little closer into the, the take a little closer look um, into the buildings trends and and uh, the question of how can energy sufficiency be included uh, and, and and thought about in building and in buildings. Oh, sorry. So. Um, Maybe just very briefly, why are we interested in energy sufficiency in buildings? Um, the left figure you see is um, something that I present actually pretty often to, um, to show why we do not have um, any energy savings in the buildings um, in, in Germany for the last 10 years, more or less. Um, and the problem is that we do see efficiency works. This is this uh, pink line 
where you see the energy demand per square meter going down. But as at the same time, the living space per capita goes up for a couple of uh, decades now, the problem is that the energy demand per capita is pretty stable. And interestingly enough, all kinds of scenarios we have um, are still assuming that this living space um, trend will continue for a couple of the next decades. So it's interesting because this is, these are not scenarios from a building um, company or, or, the, or the building branches, but it's energy and climate scenarios that assume these living space still increasing. And having a look at um, the European trend, we see that the per capita um, living space is extremely diverse from um, Romania being, I mean, these numbers are not that brand new, but, but still it's pretty much in the, in the, in the range. It is uh, not very diff different today. So from 1819 uh, square meters uh, per person up to more than 60 square meters per person, this is pretty much the range we, we see in uh, the different European countries. And in the trend per se, you see that pretty much everywhere, um, the increase of living space per capita is the same for, for European countries. But, um, to now say what do we understand um, when we talk about an energy sufficiency in buildings um, to make it very easy we say sufficiency is the state between where you do not have not enough but you also you neither have too much so it's somewhere between scarcity and abundance um, a little more complex uh, we we borrowed um, the donut economics uh, figure from uh, Kate Railworth, uh, which you might know, and um, their colleagues, Sarah Darbert and Tina Fawcett, they adapted it for um, the sufficiency, energy sufficiency aspect. And um, this is pretty much what we say, there is a basic need. Um, this housing and adequate housing is a basic need. And there should be adequate housing for everybody. But at the same time, the housing per se must not, um, must, must, not, must not exceed the ecological limits we have. So, so this is where we say this is the space, what we call sufficiency. So where do we now find the energy sufficiency potentials in buildings? Um, I, I picked these two maps, although they are um, not really showing the same. Um, this is one, the European map is from a project we did um, for the ECEEE, um, where apart from the square meter area per person, we also had some other in indicators we, we were looking at. It would be too much to go into detail now. But maybe it's not surprising, but, but anyhow, you see in, in the northern and western countries, the potential for, building, for energy sufficiency in buildings is um, the highest, while in the eastern countries, it's, uh, it's much lower. And the other map is a city map from a city in Germany called Göttingen. And this is what, um, what they did for the different um, areas they have, the city quarters. Um, and they had a look uh, how the per capita living area is um, divided in the city. And also this is quite interesting if, um, if you see that also in, in German cities you have areas where you are close to Romanian um, living space areas. Uh, and in others we are close to, to Denmark and other countries. So it is not like we have this, you know, it's, it's always an average when we, when we talk about, well, Germany has a per capita area for living as at the moment, 46, 47 square meters. But this is really quite diverse if you have a closer look into the cities. So why is this a problem now? Um, we have, of course, we see some environmental aspects and effects. Um, the, the one point is the daily land use for settlements. At least in Germany, we did not reach our um, interim target for 2020 last year. 
Um, we also have the problem with um, um, adapting our cities to climate change. The more space we need, the more um, area we build, it makes the adaption, the resilience to climate change more difficult, of course. And as we heard before, it's a huge area where we consume energy and resources. Uh, but this also has some social effects and um, especially in the growing cities we have do have a housing shortage so it is reality it's not everywhere also it, this also is quite diverse um, and spread uh, over the country but on the other hand we also see some social effects um, if you go to the people and ask them um, are you content and how far is the size equality and there you can see that a too big house or a too big flat can also be a burden, especially when you, you know, like becoming elder, the physical capacity gets, gets uh, less. So the, and then there's another point also, um, the, the less you have the opportunity to leave your house due to barriers, um, and due to, to the physical capacity that you have, um, people report that they feel isolated. So also this is an effect of these two big and the question of how do we live um, aspect and trends we see in Germany. And then interestingly enough, um, the, the call for building new is not only happening in the growing cities. But the strategy that we see in shrinking cities is also building new. The reason is that they say, if we just propose um, new, modern, um, very likely single family houses, then we attract families, we attract new inhabitants. But of course, as, as you can imagine, this, this does not work everywhere and not all over the place. So uh, we also see that these new built um, developments are rather taken by people moving from the city centers to the, to the outer areas. And we see uh, this, um, yeah, these developing donut cities and, and, and donut municipalities. So they, the, the city centers lose inhabitants and with them their functions and become this donut again, but in this time it's it's not as positive as the donut from Cape Wales, maybe. So, um, as I said, there are people who are really looking for more sufficient housing concepts. We do have a housing shortage, but in the same at the same time and in the same cities, we see these underoccupied homes, and. Um, we are looking at a couple of um, options, how, what, what you can do if you're looking for more area sufficient or floor area sufficient housing. We are looking at adaptation. So can I adapt my home? Can I separate, for example, a living unit in my home? Um, can I sublet rooms or this single new um, living unit? We are looking at home exchange programs and we are also looking at um, what co-housing can, um, it, in how far co-housing can support energy sufficiency in buildings. And if you're looking at it, it it's actually, it, it works quite well if you come from the circular economy and the, and, and the waste um, uh, slogan, reduce, reuse, recycle. And maybe when with looking at buildings, I would add a fourth R which is rebuild. So all these are actually is, is pretty much the same strategy to support energy sufficiency in buildings. So there are people, um, there is a market actually, I mean, we are talking beyond growth, but nevertheless, uh, there is, there are people out there who are looking for new housing concepts who, who know very well that there is, um, that there are alternatives out there between the single family home and uh, the elderly people's home so that there are alternatives that have uh, that can offer quite a high quality um, for housing and living. So what can governments do now? Um, a colleague of mine proposed a couple of years ago already um, a so-called living space moratorium. This is pr actually what PM said when um, how can we how can we build less? Uh, I think it's quite difficult for communities to just decide we do not build new, but
But if there would be a living space moratorium that says you are only allowed as a municipality to, to build new buildings somewhere at the outskirts, if you really have an increase in population, that might help. We also see some, some, some existing regulations where sufficiency easily could be adopted at, for example, like all these kinds of building performance regulations we have. Of course, in the procurement, um, you also have possibilities. You can add targets and limits where it is possible. And you can support also projects with public welfare um, because usually um, it's, the, uh, it's, it's the households with um, the highest income who use most, uh, most of the areas in the biggest houses. You can do some financial um, initiatives like moving support so you, can, so you can help especially elderly people being leftovers being the empty nesters in two big houses and flats and often it is reported that the new smaller flat might be even more in, in more expensive than your old big flat which is right but also there we have programs and, and, and single examples where you have a rental fee guarantee so that the smaller flat you choose is definitely not more uh, not more expensive or at least a couple of euros cheaper than the flat you have before. You could also think about when looking at support, financial support programs, you could have programs for density, community and change of use, for example, which we are missing in, in many areas. And of course, you can do some, some, some public um, aspects of in, in municipalities, you can support flat, flat exchange. Um, you can offer advice and campaigns and you, of course, can do competition and implement pilot projects. So this is, these are some suggestions that I brought today and I promised I'll stick to my 10 minutes, um, though I could talk on this topic for much longer, but I'll stop here and so I'm open for questions later. Thank you. Thanks, Anya. Um, and I see there are already a number of questions uh, in the Q and A, uh, so we'll uh, we'll pick a few of those uh, in the discussion that's going to follow. Um, we turn now to uh, the third presentation, which is by Yamina Saheb. Yamina, the floor is yours. Uh... Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Frédéric, and thank you to EB for the invitation. Um, I will present a few recommendations that are included in the blueprint that the EEB is launching today. Blueprint includes 20 recommendations, and I will focus mainly on the sufficiency ones and a little bit on the renovation uh, wave. Uh, so uh, my presentation is good follow up, I think, of the two previous ones, because what the first thing that we can show is the impact of uh, how can I go to the next slide? Okay. So the, the impact of the lack of sufficiency policies in the EU policies, uh, between 1990 and 2018, uh, emissions from the built environment, this is just residential buildings, have decreased. However, when we look at carefully, uh, we see that uh, part of the decrease was driven by efficiency improvement. And today we'll be generous and I will allocate this to the EPPD directive. And the other part was driven by the decarbonization of the supply. And let's say that it's driven by the Renewable Energy Directive. However, we have an increase of emissions that, that is driven by the lack of sufficiency uh, policies. Uh, and basically what we are used to here uh, that is described as this is the red one and uh, there are no policies at the EU level for uh, to address sufficiencies, uh, sufficiency issues. Uh, and what we are used to here uh, described by economists as a rebound effect of efficiency and actually is not really a rebound effect because efficiency technological improvement of building components and product is a reality. However, if you have efficiency without sufficiency, then you have an increase of, um, uh, of the consumption and consequently of CO2 emissions. So what is the reason for this increase? 
this is very similar to, to what uh, uh, Anya showed. So over time, this is between 20, 2000 and 2017, the floor area per capita has increased uh, and it increased, it correlates well with the increase of the GDP per capita in EU countries. So in almost all countries, it increased. Maybe the worst case is Ireland and Luxembourg. Um, and uh, uh, what are the consequences of this increase of floor area? is also another point that was a little bit discussed by the previous speakers. The consequences, especially in aging with our aging population, is that we have an increase of the share of the population living in under-occupied housing. And what you see in this graph is that countries we are used to consider as green, like for example, Denmark, Netherlands, Sweden, these are the countries with the highest share of the population living in under-occupied dwellings. Uh, and in the other side of the spectrum, uh, countries, uh, Eastern European countries, or countries with low GDP per capita compared to the EU average, are the countries uh, facing the issue of overcrowded dwellings. So we have two issues that are related to this, uh, that are a result of the floor area per uh, square meter. Uh, per, per capita. And of course, this has an impact on uh, an economic impact. The economic impact is uh, the, especially for the low income families, because the, uh, those living in um, the high, there is a high share of the population living in under occupied dwellings uh, that are usually retired people uh, with low pensions. And uh, the, um, the cost, the housing cost is very high for them. So it increases the economic uh, impact or the economic stress on these families. Uh, and then you see, uh, again, uh, you see a huge discrepancy between EU countries. Countries with low GDP per capita uh, are those where uh, the housing cost uh, is very high for low income compared to other uh, countries. Uh, what, uh, what are the sufficiency measures? Why we are in this situation? Uh, after reviewing uh, almost all the literature of, uh, on sufficiency, I realized that sufficiency policies are non-energy policies. Here a short summary of um, the four sufficiency levers or pillars. And we see that if you look at the last uh, bar, the, you see that the policies that to address these levers, for example, downsizing the buildings, uh, ensuring uh, reuse of buildings or repurposing buildings, uh, moving from ownership to usership, uh, the choice between multifamily buildings and single family buildings, all these issues are not addressed by energy policies. And this may explain why we have in the first graph an increase of CO2 emission that results from energy uh, consumption, which is targeted by energy policies, but not by uh, sufficiency uh, policies. Um, and this, uh, despite the fact that in the EU, we have plenty, we have in total 20, 20 instruments targeting the building sector. Uh, this figure is a bit old, so it's not uh, really updated with the latest instrument that I discovered over time. Uh, but uh, just to give you an idea, we have almost, we have 20 instruments, none of them includes one single measure that is sufficiency measure. I couldn't identify any sufficiency measure in 20 instruments that we have. So it's not surprising, the first graph that I showed is not, not any more surprising to me after I analyzed uh, the policy instrument. What does that mean from the Renovation Wave perspective? So the Renovation Wave is a welcome initiative launched by the Commission in 2020. The aim is to renovate, is to decarbonize the EU building stock and um, However, this decarbonization, uh, the, 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 the initiative, as, as it is described in the communication from the Commission, for the time being, it aims at doubling the renovation rate. Uh, the renovation rate in, in the same document, the Commission provides different figures for the renovation rate. And the renovation rate that makes sense, actually the only one that makes sense from decarbonization perspective is the decarbonization, are the renovation rates related to uh, deep renovation, even if deep renovation is not zero. But let's say this is, this is the most ambitious one. Unfortunately, this one is uh, the rate of this renovation is zero. It at zero point two percent. So this means that by considering that we have two hundred twenty million, as considered in the communication, we have a little bit more buildings. But this is what the communication from the Commission considered. By doubling this renovation rate, this means you end up renovating every year eight hundred eighty thousand homes. 
880,000 homes, it's not possible to get after 10 years because the same renovation uh, wave document includes two figures doubling the renovation rate with the aim to achieve to, to, uh, to, uh, to, re uh, to reach 35 million of buildings renovated by 2030. 35 million by 2030, this means we, have, we need to renovate 3.5 million per year. And actually, by doubling the renovation rate, the renovation that makes sense, the deep renovation, we are at 880,000. So we are we are below what, what is needed. So the first thing I think what we need to do is to ensure consistency between all the figures. The commission needs to ensure consistency between all the figures and ensure above that, if you look at the, the green part of this uh, figure, is to make sure that the renovation wave is aligned with the Paris Agreement, which is not the case at all. So. The Paris Agreement introduced the concept of the 1.5 degree target, and the IPCC 2018 special report translated this 1.5 degree target into carbon budget. Based on this work from the IPCC, we know that if we continue to emit emissions like we have done uh, before the, the COVID crisis, so we know that uh, the carbon budget will be depleted by 2028. This means we have, if we are to be Paris compliant, this means that the building stock, the EU building stock, should be decarbonized by 2028. And in this case, it means that we need to renovate 33 million homes per, per year. We are not at all targeting, we are not at all aligned with the Paris Agreement. Uh, so this issue, this, this is an important, this is a huge issue actually, because the, the 35 million building units that the commission is talking about include uh, shallow renovation or basically just replacing your boiler or replacing your window. And this is not going to be uh, to align us with the Paris Agreement. And then uh, how, to, how to include sufficiency in policy in policy making in the EU and why it's not included because sufficiency is about the well-being of the people and the current policies are not really about the well-being of the people. They are about more profit, more growth uh, for those uh, taking advantage of these policies. And one evidence from that is, uh, so the Renovation Wave initiative, the Commission launched as usual, uh, launched the stakeholders uh, 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 stakeholders uh, feedback, ask stakeholders for feedback on the Renovation Wave. And actually, when you look at uh, the stakeholders feedback, uh, the Commission received 187 feedbacks. And it, everything looks perfect, except that when you realize that actually citizens, you have only 6% of the feedbacks from citizens. And the rest is from what I consider as corporates and their allies. Because, for example, if you take NGOs, those labeled in the Commission report as NGOs are actually think tanks funded by, by industry. And it's not surprising at all to see that the, one, one of the major proposals from the stakeholders is to introduce MEPS, Minimum Energy Performance Standards, which is uh, an instrument advocated for by industry. And this instrument basically uh, is about renovating uh, buildings from a step-by-step -step, uh, process. And we, as, I, as we have seen in the previous slide, uh, we need to renovate now 33 million homes per day, uh, per, per year, sorry, at the zero level, at the zero standard. And with step-by-step, -step, you cannot reach zero in seven years. It's impossible. But this is what we have. And unfortunately, uh, I am uh, quite sure that uh, the MEPS will be one of the proposals in the impact assessment uh, from the Commission, but I hope that the Parliament will stop it. Uh, and uh, my takeaway from all this work is that to ensure that all citizens are, are living in uh, uh, the houses they deserve to, to live, we need to make out of principles 19 and 20 of the European uh, pillar of social rights and enforce enforceable rights. So in some EU countries, it is, it is a right, but not enforceable right. It's the case, for example, in France. And we need absolutely that the package, the 55 uh, package that the Commission is working on needs absolutely to include sufficiency. So moving from efficiency and renewables, which is just technological solution, to the SIR framework, which is sufficiency, efficiency, renewables. And given the number of instruments that we have for buildings to ensure consistency between all the requirements, I really advocate for uh, sustainable building regulation above all these instruments uh, to be able to renovate Europe. Otherwise, uh, we, we are not going to uh, decarbonize the building stock. And importantly, uh, is to remove from policy instrument, from EU policy instrument, 
all the instruments that delay climate action because delaying climate action means an ex extending uh, energy extending uh, energy poverty and misusing public finance and among these instruments we have maps building passport stage deep renovation major renovation and tipping points and finally to make this happening we need an eu citizen assembly because citizens are the only ones who work on their well-beings thank you for your attention and you can download the blueprint. Thank you, Yamina. Um, and so now we can uh, turn to the two uh, policymakers uh, who have prepared, uh, I think, a short uh, reaction, each one of them. We'll start with uh, a reaction from the European Parliament and uh, Kieran Cuff, um, Green MEP from Ireland. Kieran. Well, thank you and uh, good afternoon. I was really struck by all three presentations. Uh, my own background um, prior to being in the European Parliament, uh, I'm trained as an architect and as an urban planner. So I was particularly taken by uh, Pia Mammoth's uh, initial discussion about the siting of buildings, uh, but also the wider issues about limits on the size, use and ownership. And that kind of point was taken up by Anya as well when she talked about under occupation. Uh, and then finally, I think a very sobering presentation uh, from uh, Yamina talking uh, about even the ambitious renovation rates of 880,000 units per year being absolutely inefficient to keep us in line with our, our Paris goals. And, this is the dilemma I face every day of the week as a parliamentarian. I would imagine that my group, the Greens European Free Alliance group, are probably more ambitious on climate than any other group. But yet within the parliament, we cannot get a majority for action at the speed and pace uh, that is needed. So it's somewhat challenging. But you know, we can argue about the numbers. We can argue about how many, uh, you know, 55%, 65% reductions by 2030 or 51.8. We're not doing enough. But the grain of measures that are needed is where the real arguments are. The, the challenges that we have in many properties being under-occupied and yet many people living in overcrowded uh, accommodation. This is where I think the different legal instruments that we put in place will be of real interest to try and get more optimal use of the buildings that we already have. I think some of the possibilities that were touched on, uh, the crazy um, residential home sizes, the McMansions, I just think it's very hard to get political buy-in to limiting the upper size of residential units. I'd love to see it happen. But I think within the um, Overton window of politics, it will be difficult to control issues uh, like that. And yet, over the last two years, within the political frame, there has been huge changes. I think the European Green Deal was unthinkable under the previous European Commission and parliament. So the level of ambition is much higher, of ambition is much higher than we saw before. The level of ambition from the new uh, US administration stands in sharp contrast to what we saw under the previous uh, US president. So the ground is changing quite significantly. And we know over the next three months, we will see proposed revisions of the Energy Performance Directive, the Renewable Energy Directive, and by the end of the year, the Energy Performance in Buildings Directive. So there is the possibility for significant change. And I know from the kind of discussions I've had with financial institutions, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the European Investment Bank, the European Central Bank, and even the private lending houses, Blackstone, the banks here in Belgium and elsewhere, they want to put money into renovation 
And they are saying very simply to group to meetings that I'm in, we have the money. What we need is a level of certainty in terms of return on investment. That return doesn't have to be high, but it has to be there. And I think we all need to focus on how we can make it clear that renovations can deliver a good rate of return. And I think the money will flow. But the other points that were made here as well, we need to improve the skills base. Uh, so we need uh, training uh, for everyone working in the built environment. We need to appeal to ordinary citizens. That, that, that point, Yamina, that you made that only 2% of the submissions were from actual citizens. Well, I think we have to look towards those regions in Europe where we see successful citizen-led renovation uh, initiatives, the one-stop shops, the places citizens can go to uh, to get advice. And citizens do need to be at the heart of the renovation wave. They are in the Czech Republic with the new green savings initiative where the government uses uh, funds to incentivize and finance uh, renovations. That's a real success story. And we do have to focus on energy poverty uh, because we've all, we're all familiar with the figures on how many people have their fuel disconnected every year, how many people are leave, living in leaky buildings. Very simply, we need to target our social housing and our public housing first. We need to bring in the deep renovations there to bring in the A-level renovations for those who will benefit most from it. People living in overcrowded conditions, a lack of ventilation. You know, in these times of COVID, a deep renovation improves the ventilation, it improves the indoor air quality, and it lowers the fuel bills. And above all that, it reduces the carbon footprint. So there needs to be a, a big focus uh, on that. And I would always say that the revision of any of these directives, it needs to be socially and environmentally just. There's no, there's no um, saving the planet without improving uh, the quality of people's lives, particularly those who are facing challenges in paying the bills at the end of the month. That's why we say the minimum energy performance standards are important. Uh, they, they will target the worst performing buildings. The building renovation passports uh, always, uh, also help uh, with all of this. And we're taking, thankfully, a deeper understanding of buildings. We're looking at the, the carbon cost of the materials that we put into them. Uh, we're looking at the, the, the wider environmental issues that uh, puts a bonus on low embodied carbon. Uh, we're also looking at, as, as you have said, making better use of the most sustainable buildings of all, which is the buildings that we've already built. And the French um, uh, architects who won the Pritzker Prize for Architecture a few weeks ago said very clearly, we focus on renovating existing buildings because they are the most sustainable. That message needs to, needs to get home uh, very strongly. And I do take the point that there is a danger that we, um, that we simply, people will turn up the dial on their thermostat as we renovate the buildings. But that's why we need to do the deep renovations because even if people increase the indoor temperatures, the ener energy savings will be very high. It's not just about the numbers. It's not just about the European directives that we bring in. We need to bring the member states with us and they will have to prioritize renovations in their recovery plans uh, and they need to bring citizens with them. It can't be done as a top-down initiative. It has to start with ordinary communities working together with local, regional and national governments to make this happen. So we need action at a European Union level, but we need action within the heart of communities. I leave it at that, and I'm happy to comment further as questions arise. Thank you. Thanks, Kieran. Uh, let me turn now for a reaction by Stefan Moser from the European Commission. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick, um, um, and uh, to uh, 
to Pia and yeah and Yamina and and also Kiaran for their for their for their um, contributions and and what they said uh, very interesting uh, definitely and it's uh, very important to think about these uh, various aspects in in depth. Um, I, I would agree very much with, with Karen uh, and also several uh, statements uh, done previously that we, we need to prioritize renovations over new builds. Um, it's clear uh, we, we, we need to reduce the impact on the environment as much as we can. And uh, for that, we, we basically should not create any further damage, but rather uh, repair, renovate what we have. Uh, there's a lot to do. Uh, we need to see how we do that best uh, by on the one hand, um, bringing in the citizens um, in terms of willingness, uh, readiness, uh, but also motivation to actually act. Uh, that is very important um, when it comes to climate energy. Um, often citizens are more motivated by, by comfort, uh, understandably aesthetics, um, but not necessarily in the first place uh, by, by energy and, and climate issues. And, and that indeed, May then lead sometimes to a rebound effect if there's more efficiency because uh, it's the comfort which is increased at, at lower cost. Yeah? So, so we need to work very much with the behavior um, and, and work with citizens about behavior, um, about values, uh, how each one of us can contribute to reaching climate and energy objectives. So it requires um, certainly more than just technological solutions, but rather a society wide. Um, uh, movement and approach uh, that is that is indeed uh, very important. Um, but on the other hand, we also need the technological solutions, uh, innovation, but also deploy them um, as much as we can with new technologies such as uh, heat pumps. Uh, um, of course, also existing well tested test technologies like insulating, uh, making sure that the, the building is is upgraded uh, uh, as much as possible to to a, a digital ready, smart ready. A building where uh, the, the inhabitants can interact really um, as, as active um, inhabitants and not just consume, but rather direct the building adjusted to their needs. And that requires uh, both an upgrade in the, in the physical um, um, uh, properties of the building, but also the skills of the inhabitants and also again, the willingness to do that actually, because only then it can work. Um, we need to create awareness uh, about the key data in a building so that actually the inhabitants are able to, to measure and then also uh, show interest and develop interest in, in, in regulating their home. For instance, by looking at the temperature, what it means if you would turn down by one degree, etc. So there are devices for all that, uh, but there needs to be firstly the technological readiness and then also the, the, the psychological readiness to use these information, uh, these pieces of information. Uh, and then, of course, we have the money side. Um, we we are. It is pretty clear that uh, only part of uh, the the advantages um, and benefits from renovating will will be captured uh, as a private good. In particular, when there are complex housing uh, structures in in multi apartment buildings uh, where you have tenants and owners, etc. Um, a lot of the advantages and, and benefits from a renovation is actually a public good. Yeah? So you, you, create, you, you of course, um, make progress towards um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, you save energy, but also you increase the quality uh, of the building in terms of uh, um, have a higher inclusion in society, more inclusiveness, more justice, uh, more accessibility, more safety in the building, uh, better health. Um, uh, take out basically by taking out uh, harmful materials, but also uh, humidity, for instance, is used, and 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 that is, uh, I would say, a huge value in itself. Um, uh, and that's why the renovation wave actually called for a holistic assessment um, when it comes to renovation, uh, by bringing together uh, in a renovation uh, various co-benefits um, in order to uh, basically uh, achieve the the maximum out of a renovation but also to increase then the motivation to actually carry out a renovation, because then you, you really are convinced that it's worthwhile going through the trouble, through the pain, uh, with all the dust and dirt and noise, which, which comes along with the renovation. And of course, then there's, there, there are multiple benefits from the money invested. And, and uh, as I said, uh, there's a the big public good component. This justifies, therefore, uh, the use of public funds to a large degree 
uh, in order to create basically in the end a better society. Um, so um, only part of the money can be uh, can be um, directly. Um, I mean, the, the 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 profitability can 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 only be one driving force, but the public policy needs to come in here through state aid on the national level, but also European funds, uh, uh, the the multi-annual financial framework, um, but also and that's now a huge opportunity, the recovery funds which are which have been made available to overcome the health crisis, uh, the reduction in economic activity, uh, to basically um, create alternative employment for people because. Um, uh, it is it is it is absolutely interesting to talk about uh, a world beyond growth, but we also need to basically have uh, employment uh, for for citizens. That's that's necessary for their for their for their uh, livelihoods, but employment which is sustainable, where they will have um, um, a decent income to survive, but also to do things uh, which are good for society. And and the renovation sector is one of them, which the Commission. And of course, in agreement with the Parliament and and I think member states and civil society has identified as one which can really uh, provide an opportunity for employment uh, for the next generation, for the for now, but also I would say for several decades, um, where we need to do things which have to be done in any event, and where we have to do much more than so far, where we have to upgrade and therefore can take in people who can be upskilled, reskilled. From other sectors uh, which may not um, have the same level of activity in the future through change of lifestyles but also structural changes following the the uh, the, the the health health crisis from covid and that is basically what we need to do we we uh, we have to to upskill and and train people who may have only partial knowledge for now what it takes to really renovate in a sustainable manner the buildings which we need in the future, um, and also create full awareness of the technologies available, what it takes to make them successfully deployed, such as heat pumps, for instance, renewable energy, um, and of course, then also for the users, as said at, right at the beginning, uh, what it takes to be an intelligent inhabitant of a building, a responsible inhabitant in a building. Um, and that, I would say, includes also in a broader dimension, uh, the, the readiness of people to move to be more mobile in the future this will then uh, lead to a more uh, efficient allocation of buildings uh, to the uh, over over the lifetime changing needs of the inhabitants uh, typical thing is a single person then you create a family um, you uh, you have children you need a, you move in a bigger house and that's that's usually happening because you simply need more space for the children but once the children move out many people get stuck and stay there until, uh, well, even well beyond the time the children will have moved out of the house. You have sit in a much too large house, but you stay there. It is a psychological phenomenon. You don't want to move. Most people or many people don't want to move, but that is uh, basically a, a behavior thing. It's, it's a, a choice by those people if they can afford it, but it's at the same time, uh, there needs to be more awareness and, and that can be created in a society-wide, I would say, movement. Um, that people will become more aware that this is actually not efficient. So to, to create more readiness to, to move back into smaller um, uh, spaces, uh, and, and that would actually lead to uh, an overall uh, less harmful impact on the environment. Uh, but that, I think, in, in my understanding, and, and there I, I might, may disagree with several of, of you who have spoken before, this, I think, in, in a society, in, in the society which we have, um, will have to be done on a voluntary basis, can be accompanied by incentives, uh, including financial incentives by taxation, uh, possibly even positive incentives, uh, education, or even financial incentives to move out uh, to overcome the inconveniences of a move, for instance, and to get help. But it cannot be ordered. So I think it, it, may, it, it will not be possible, in my view, to have upper limits, for instance, on the living space. Uh, you can create disincentives financially, but not upper limits in, in, in the sense of you have to move out, you can't stay there. Imagine someone uh, uh, remains alone after the family life and the partner may have died and then you are told you can't have to move out because your house is too big. I think this is simply one step too far. And we don't need to, in my view, we don't need to go into such a debate because we have to concentrate on, on making the biggest possible progress now in, in moving forward in having a, a kind of active and positive agenda with citizens, taking them along but in a, in, a, in a kind of, I would say, 
um, motivational uh, manner where, where they see the benefits and do that on a voluntary basis. I think that's where I think where the limits are and the policies which the commission uh, together with the parliament and member states and also at sub-national level and civil society will have to put in place, I think should be really positive um, motivations uh, by creating incentives, help, support, but not more than that. Um, but I do, I do agree with you that the sufficiency concept is a very important idea to be explained to people, um, to citizens uh, more broadly, and the inhabitants of buildings, uh, what in principle uh, could be seen as a kind of reasonable behavior by, by citizens. But, but this would then be a kind of voluntary choice by each and every one, depending also on their financial abilities, et cetera. Um, that, of course, I think is, is important. You, ha you have taxation, of course, for, for heating fuels, for instance, you can make sure that it becomes more expensive in terms of taxation if you live in a large house, but that's probably as far as I would see uh, uh, you can go, and, and that not at the European level. This is really a national domain also, so it would not be, cannot be taken forward by the Commission. Um, some other aspects, very briefly, briefly I, I very largely agree with, with Kiaran. Uh, we have also worked hand in hand uh, between the Parliament and the Commission. Um, it's very important to work uh, on a, uh, with larger groups of people, so you cannot really make the renovation wave a success if you work just one by one individual buildings. You need to create types of buildings, uh, standardized solutions, but also work um, with neighborhoods, uh, energy communities. Um, you, you have to basically create package solutions also uh, for the very fact that it may be too difficult for individuals to do it all. And, and, and then this would not lead to the necessary volumes of renovations and also would not achieve the, the necessary depth of renovations. You have to uh, professionalize, you have to share the cost of professionals amongst many people in order to really make this happen. Otherwise, it's prohibitively expensive. And if you don't have professionals, it simply will not happen because people are overwhelmed. Even with one-stop shops, they may not be able to, to get through this from the motivation or the difficulties. You have to go to the administration to ask for a permit, the architects, the technical questions, financial questions, all that. So you can go through this only if you basically have a citizen uh, movement in a in a neighborhood in a in a in a district, for instance, where uh, where you get advice also, which is then uh, of course has to be paid, but can be shared across many people. So I think that is very important and requires uh, local um, politicians to come in and motivate their citizens and work hand in hand with them. The cities and and municipalities have to support that very strongly, uh, and that I think what what we are also uh, trying to do. And then maybe last thing, aesthetics. Aesthetics is very important for citizens. That's why the, the commission launched also the European Bauhaus. Uh, this is a cultural identity and is actually what many people are mostly motivated by. How does it look like? What is the style here, here? And this has to be combined with the functional aspects as important as they are, but not everybody is interested in that. Yeah? So we have to appeal to the large majority of people. And I think uh, there you need to create these kind of smart packages where everyone could then be motivated by. So with that, I would like to thank you very much and look forward to the further exchange. Thank you, uh, Stefan Moser. And um, uh, let me start um, the, uh, the discussion now with, uh, with a question um, you know, to, to all of you, but maybe I will start with the, uh, with the politicians. And uh, Stefan, you, you alluded to that, so maybe I won't ask the question to you, but um, uh, you, you did say that it it's, doesn't seem very politically uh, feasible to put a limit uh, really on the number of dwellings that people may own or, or maybe putting a limit on the number of square meters uh, that, that people may, uh, may have. Um, so uh, let me turn to Kieran Kuff maybe uh, first for that uh, question. P politically speaking, uh, Kieran, how do you think this is, you know, can, can that be ever um, something uh, that could be palatable, uh, politically speaking, that, that people could end up subscribing to at some point or, or putting limits on those things is, is already too much uh, like political fiction maybe? I think it varies significantly from member state to member state. Uh, I know within my own uh, country of, of Ireland, uh, there's a long history of colonialism and the right to own land was hard fought for. 
and therefore people are very possessive about home ownership and the right to do what one wants with one's land. I think you would find similar strong belief in the right to do what one wants with private property as you move into Central Europe, where up until 30 years ago, uh, there were limits on private ownership. And I just wonder in the broader scheme of things, should that be a focus on our work if we want to bring about meaningful reductions in greenhouse gas emissions? Or should we be looking at other levers or other instruments to bring this about? My, I suspect other levers may be more successful. Um, we mentioned grants, uh, loans, and similar instruments that can appeal to people to choose the right fuels or do the right kind of upgrade. But then I also think that we need to nudge people at particular moments in their lives to make the right uh, decision. I'm, I'm 58, I'm coming into that empty nesting territory. If there was a nudge that said, look, you're in a house that's too big, Here, here's an incentive to move, I jump at it tomorrow. Um, you know, in, in my own home city of Ireland, there's not a big supply of, of units that are not too small and not too big. So maybe local authorities and government incentives can get the right housing mix within particular neighborhoods. So people don't have to move out of their neighborhood when they want to shift dwelling. And also look at the fiscal instruments. Sometimes there are taxes that you have to pay when you change from one dwelling to another. Uh, I think we should apply pressure to make that change as easy as possible in terms of fiscal, um, fiscal incentives. So I think there's a lot that can be done without putting in place fairly draconian measures on limiting the upper size of dwellings. I think spatial planning is a hugely important instrument. I'd say that because I'm an urban planner, but I know at the moment in Ireland, one third of the new homes are being built in the open countryside, which is madness because the carbon footprint of the individual's travel patterns will be huge compared to the carbon footprint of the annual running costs of the dwelling that they live in. So I think we need to integrate the wider issues of transport and mobility as Pia uh, mentioned in her presentation. Thank you, Kieran. Um, and, and let me turn um, uh, still uh, very briefly to Stefan uh, Moser, um, because, I mean, as you said, um, most of the incentives, um, they would be decided um, at, at the national level uh, for the most part, um, especially when it comes to, to, to taxation, and social uh, policy, et cetera. Uh, but still at the European level, um, there's an upcoming package, um, which includes a revision of the energy taxation directive. Um, and, and that could be a simple way of nudging people as well, because currently you've got higher taxes on things like electricity, um, which is more efficient for housing uh, homes than, than gas, which is a fossil fuel. Um, I mean, is, is that also one area where the European Union can make a difference? Uh, Stefan Moser. Certainly, Frederick. Um, uh, we need to get taxation right um, in the sense of, of really um, reflecting in the tariffs, um, uh, in, in the tax rates, uh, the, the impact on, on, on climate, um, what is actually good. So to, to rationalize um, the, the, the tax rates, uh, depending on on the uh, climate impacts uh, and 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 to have uh, uh, therefore uh, evidence um, uh, an evidence basis for setting them and 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 not basically uh, uh, let them just uh, uh, be set uh, according to traditions or, or just uh, what people what politicians may think is 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 okay politically etc in a particular country uh, then we make progress now huh, to to create incentives which are really targeted and well measured uh, and can be explained also why uh, it's very important in a democracy of course to be able to explain and justify 
but and that only works if we if you have the data um, available to 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 measure the the the, the carbon uh, uh, footprint of certain actions and then uh, uh, align taxation accordingly but taxation and um, and also other financial incentives are uh, a very Im important component but cannot be the only one i think in in the renovation and building sector we are confronted uh, with the situation that there's no single solution there 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 are multiple barriers and we have to work on all of them some of them are technical others are financial um, others are really um, um, in terms of um, standard setting um, to to have objectives and and uh, and, and obligations so um, from a regulatory side uh, and then uh, if you put them all together then you will make a, a real step change otherwise it will only be a partial acceleration of renovations, but we need to really move fast. And I do agree with what several um, speakers have said, but also uh, other stakeholders have said that actually uh, at least doubling the renovation rate may not even be enough to, at least not to reach the Paris Agreement. Uh, we are of course also captured in between what in principle we should be doing and what we consider to be realistic because we also have to work um, not only with the people, but also with the construction sector, the renovation sector, the financial means available, and um, and and we are we are somehow working under several constraints. And I think here in, in the EU, but also at the national level, um, the governments and and the legislators are called upon to to develop uh, ambitious but also realistic policies. So that is uh, even if and and then of course we have to see if we. If we feel that we won't get far enough, how can we accelerate? That requires a deeper debate. But it's, uh, it's I think, equally harmful to, to, to put in place frameworks, for instance, which would simply hang in the air and would not be grounded uh, in the sense of, of, being, um, of, of dragging along people uh, in, 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 a, in an ambitious but still realistic manner uh, that you would have the means absorption capacity of the of the renovation sector for instance and all that so that requires and the skills available overall so that requires a, a broader assessment i think and, and 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 according to that knowledge we can then set also objectives which which will be achieved because if we set, set objectives too high it might just lead to more more of a failure than anything else so. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, let me turn now to our three uh, academics or, or, or experts. Uh, so we, we, we heard and we kind of we can kind of anticipate that setting limits on the, you know, on people's ownership of, of buildings in a way or another is going to be quite difficult, uh, politically speaking, both Kieran Cuff and Stefan Moser pointed to that. Um, is that something that you that you accept that you recognize and and have you thought of maybe um, ways to to nudge people towards uh, the objectives that you outlined but without putting such like strict policies that would limit um, uh, people's freedom um, um, after all to uh, to do what they want uh, Pia Mamut, maybe a, a reflection on that yes to begin with, um, personally speaking, I can very much um, um, recognize what has been said about, about the difficulty to, to have upper limits, especially if we think of such upper limits as being enforced politically top down. And this is nothing that I had in mind when I introduced this idea of lower and upper limits. I was more um, heading towards what Anya pointed out, that this is about finding this range between of not having enough and maybe using up too much. Um, and this uh, process of finding, finding this range is a participatory process. And this is um, also something that I want to underline. And Yamina said it also, she showed it with her uh, figures. It is very important if we talk about upper limits, lower limits, that we have this dialogue, that we have real engagement of the citizens. And I don't remember who exactly said that, but I like that very much. That means not to start in, a, in the political arena on the European Union level, but really to have this process started in 
on the local level and to, to make it interact with different policy levels. So I hope to, to have made this clear. Um, that's uh, very important for me. So here, I very much think about co-creation. That means um, investigating what are people's needs and uh, also make them reflect on what their needs are. And I, when I talk about that, I don't have in mind to directly confront one particular lifestyle because I wanted to point out as well that even if we think about tiny houses as maybe some positive symbol, there are many particular motives involved with tiny houses that make these houses very attractive to, to individuals. And even tiny houses involve um, um, the siting in, in areas that are maybe not ecologically speaking, uh, very smart uh, decisions. So they involve long um, car rides, for instance, that these are all things that show how complex such, such lifestyle choices are and how important it is to, to engage with the people and to, to talk about such needs. Um, and I think um, one positive project, uh, project example that I have in mind is um, a project in Münster, that's the city in North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany where I live. Um, it's um, a cooperative that addresses mixed social needs and uh, it's trying to create a space for, for culture and commerce, co-living, co-working. And I think um, although it's not enough time here to present this project, for me this project really shows how important it is to, to make such, uh, such new types of co-living attractive to people. And this is something I want to conclude with as well. Mm, it's also about finding attractive narratives, um, narratives that people can identify with, such as um, narratives of the good life, of social justice. And I'm not talking um, about the social justice globally speaking, which is very important, global responsibility, but also the social justice within cities. Uh, I think Anya pointed out how diverse these city centers are to begin with. So I think thinking of sufficiency in, in relation to what can the good life be uh, and in rela relation to social justice is a very good way forward. Okay, uh, thank you, Pia. And uh, let me turn now to uh, Anya Beer with, uh, with um, actually a prolongation of the answer that Pia uh, gave. Um, and uh, this notion of, um, of sufficiency um, and actually, uh, there was a question from um, uh, one of the people in the audience who's asking what you actually mean uh, by a sufficiency centered uh, approach. Um, and the question is, uh, do you see this as some sort of uh, a top down process that could be determined by regulation? So with a, a minimum and a maximum, uh, and how can this be made? Uh, equitable. So do you see this more as top down or, or like Pia said, do you think this needs to be uh, um, a, a collaborative approach, something that Kieran Cuff, I think, also mentioned? I wouldn't say it's an either or um, question. You need both. Um, and starting with the, with the limits, we do have a limit on European level. We do have the target of net zero land use in 2050. So how to reach this without limiting anything with regarding to new buildings and new developments and new settlements. So this, this is something that I find, find quite interesting. And I'm not saying that you shall regulate the size of a house for, 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 for a single person or in general. I think that the regulation um, should at least um, think about where is what needed. And this is what, exactly what I mean by sufficiency. There are people who are saying, I'd like to live on a small, in a smaller area in another kind of housing concept. I'd like to leave my home to a family. We are talking so much about um, 
I don't know, 60% of German younger people are dreaming of single, single family houses. This is something that you can read each year when this new um, survey is done. And I never read any article about who wants, how, how of the percentage, who wants to move out. This is something that, this is the data we, do, we, we do not have, but in our surveys we see 20 to 30 percent of the elderly would like to move out, but for them there is no alternative given. And if you, and if you would adapt this, this, these targets and, and, and you would take this net zero land use for serious, and you would adapt it with the, with the ones who really would like to adapt their own living space to, to the new biogra biographic stage they're in, um, then you could reach quite a lot in this direction. At the moment, we have the situation that um, you can build the, the most efficient building, uh, passive house plus energy house right next door to an not a non renovated um, empty or under occupied building right next door, which is in my eyes completely inefficient use of finan financial subsidies, because you know it, it would make so much more sense to build something that helps this person being completely overburdened in this almost empty house, and give this older house to the family who is looking and who is maybe now building a huge new plus energy single family. Home. So, so this is what I mean, you know, this is the regulation we have right now does not take this in account at all. And, and this is what, where we need a top down approach. We just need to, who is living where, how, where is the potential? And also from the top down approach, we do see there is a need for it. This is this is the strange thing about it, you know. And this is something where I think, um, first of all, we do have this limit already. I think this is something that most people do not think about. We are all talking about climate targets, and you hardly hear anything about this this land use target. Um, second is start with the ones who are willing already. You do not have to 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 approach. You do not really need advice or. or or convince people because there are 20 to 30 percent of the elderly out there already who would like to move. This is the interesting point, but for them there is no offer. And third is um, if you would help people move by, for example, um, giving them a, a, an interesting or more comfortable housing concept right next door, um, if you change um, your, 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 your house and if you, if you, if you move in new, this is the, the first year is a window of opportunity for renovation. So by, by really trying to get more mobility into the change of houses, you also could increase the renovation rate, interestingly enough. And then, yeah, and then fourth is, um, I think we need to, to, to talk about more, um, not so much um, about, uh, do you want to forbid people how to live? No, uh, we want to, 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 to help people to live adequately. So, so I think this is, these are maybe the four points I'd, I'd see there. Thank you, Anya. Uh, let me turn to uh, Yamina Saheb. And uh, there's a question um, uh, for you uh, coming from the audience, and that's from Adrian Joyce from the Renovate Europe uh, campaign and, and Euro Ace. And so he's asking um, you to explain why you're not um, in favor of minimum energy performance standards. Um, so can you please elaborate? a bit on that um, and maybe you can say a few words also about the need for a top-down versus bottom-up uh, approach and, and whether uh, you know there's there's um, political acceptance uh, you think for potential top-down measures. Uh, I was hoping that uh, the COVID-19 teaches us all that there are top-down measures that become acceptable when we face emergency. And I was hoping that it's clear for policymakers that we are facing climate emergency and biodiversity emergency. And after the COVID, we will realize that we will face economic and social emergency. So we have fourth emergencies to deal with. And I am still hearing that we need incentives 
and we need grants. So for me, it's just a disconnect between the reality of the world and what policies are going to, to do. And it's really unfortunate for the EU because we will for sure lose the climate leadership. And I would recommend to the policymakers to get in touch with their counterparts in Japan uh, for the sufficiency concept, because Japan is one of the countries where the, the holy concept of ownership of houses is completely abundant. They have, now they face a different situation uh, because they have uh, the population in Japan, the aging population uh, is more important in Japan than in the EU. So now they have uh, another issue, a new issue that we never faced before in developed world is the fact that uh, uh, houses are abundant. People cannot live anymore these, in these big houses. They just cannot afford and they are not interested in renovating them. And this is an Unfortunately, what will happen in the EU if we don't take action now and if we miss this renovation wave. One last point about the renovation wave and sufficiency concept is that the renovation wave should not be just an energy renovation wave. It's not really labeled like that by the Commission, but in practice it is seen like that, and most of the work is related only to energy, because energy consumption is not what people are interested in. People are interested in uh, well-being, in their well-being. They are interested in having um, uh, well-heated homes, uh, well-cooled homes, etc., and not in the energy consumption and functional homes for their needs. And this is missing currently in the renovation wave. And then to answer the question of uh, how to do it if it's top down, bottom up, etc., another lesson learned uh, is, uh, for example, one of the taboo topics in Brussels and all EU capitals is making the energy renovation uh, mandatory. So this is not at all proposed. Even if we know that with the renovation rate, with, with all the incentives that we have in place, we will never achieve our targets. And we know from the French and the German experience of more than 30 years, and if I accumulate both, it would be 50 years of experience of incentives that we are not going to be able to renovate buildings. So just stop with this Incentive, incentives is waste of public money because especially if we use it for shallow renovation, it's really a waste of public money. And I hope at some point those who propose this will be accountable to their citizens. And the French Citizen Initiative Climate in Assembly proposed to make energy renovation mandatory. This is a taboo de debate in Paris. Of course, it's not what the government decided to, to keep by the end, but this is what citizens propose. So when you talk to citizens, when you build the, the when you build the policy uh, instrument with citizens, citizens know better than anyone else what is the best for them. And I think we should stop, use, uh, talk for, uh, keep saying that citizens uh, don't want this or want this, like what Anya explained about the surveys. Because the, sur the question in the survey is always based because it depends what you are looking for. Now, uh, if I come back to uh, the question of maps, why maps are wrong instruments? Maps are basically uh, about uh, saying that this year, for example, uh, social housing, we target one segment, social housing will be renovated uh, by 2025, for example, uh, social housing um, um, with the energy class F and G will no longer be uh, used. They need to be all renovated. Or you cannot anymore rent any flat that is uh, class F, for example. It needs to be above class F. The problem we have is that buildings renovated today will not be renovated again between now and 2050. There is only one cycle left. So buildings that you will renovate today to at the F level, for example, these buildings will be locked in F level until 2050. And when people pretend that the maps is about uh, getting uh, energy poor people out of energy poverty, what I say is that by doing that, you put, you, you lock energy poor people in energy poverty for at least two or three generations. This is what maps are going to do. And we are doing all that with public money. And it's just, I, I do not, the figures do not match. I, and I am not able to understand the logic behind the, how, I, I think the question should be to Adrian and Joyce, why they are defending maps. Okay. There is no logic. That, that's, uh, that, that's an interesting counter-argument. Unfortunately, we won't have time to elaborate on this. Maybe that will be for another uh, discussion 
um, on, uh, with the EB or maybe elsewhere, maybe at your active. Um, to conclude, very briefly, in just one or two sentences, I would, last, I would like uh, each one of you to say what you think should be the, the main message from today's conference. Very, very succinctly, one or two sentences. Pierre Mamut. The main message should be really to, to make sufficiency a focus and to take care that it's not being watered down in the package of or in the mix of other measures to really push this um, this agenda forward to bring it into the political arena um, and to connect it to positive engaging narratives. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Anya Beer with um, in two sentences, the main takeaway message that you want people to um, take home with them from this conference. Okay. Yeah, two messages, two points, maybe. Efficiency and sufficiency perfectly match together. Um, they, they, you, you really should connect them. And the second um, is, apart from what do we have to do to promote sufficiency, energy sufficiency in buildings, you could also think about where are the regulations that we do not need anymore. So we really have to deregulate things right. that trigger building and new buildings and more land use and more energy use and if you would deregulate in many ways that would also help yeah. okay that's uh, an interesting thought yamina saheb just in one or two sentences your main message from today's i will be short so i will complement what anya said sufficiency efficiency renewables this is the seer framework and this is the future if we would like to renovate europe and if we would like to work on the just transition we need the seer framework over to you kieran kaf your main message yeah i think we have to increase our ambition and that came out clearly from yasmina's contribution but we also have to work with legal instruments that work in my own country we have a tax on vacant sites and buildings, which has risen to 7% a year. That is an effective fiscal instrument that pushes empty sites and buildings into use. And I think it's a good example of a measure that works, that isn't covered by the directives we're discussing. And the last thing I'd say is we do need to go for deep renovations. As Janmina said, we only renovate, should renovate once in a generation. We need to do it right. Thanks, Kieran. Stephen Moser, your main message from today's conference. Thank you very much. Um, I think we need um, a framework which looks at, at the, all, the, all the different barriers, um, uh, information, um, um, financial, technical help, uh, et cetera, but also a holistic agenda. And when it comes to sufficiency, I think uh, there we need to build on a voluntary concept and in particular enable citizens to be mobile um, over their lifetimes and for that i think we need to reduce the the obstacles notably in terms of taxation uh, transactional fees when they buy and sell or when they move because then they will not yeah? so they will simply also not move because there there may be financial disadvantages for them and and that is in the in the remit of of the member states notably to reduce for instance uh uh, taxes when you sell and buy a home or when you move, um, um, because only then you can adjust. And then if you don't have uh, significant disadvantages from, from your insights that actually from a sufficiency point of view, you should move to a smaller house when you grow older. Thank you. So um, I think this wraps up uh, today's event. Um, a big thanks to the EB for supporting uh, this event and uh, inviting me to moderate it. Thank, uh, thank you as well to our panelists uh, for the time that you took uh, to speak to us today, um, as well as to our, our viewers for following us online. I hope to see you again soon. In the meantime, take care and stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Bye. Bye.